so well, just so that we don't waste the whole class sitting and waiting, so let me just remind you uh, what we're doing is we're talking about polar graphs. And so this means that we have something described in it. So polar coordinates, we have, we give the angle, and we give the distance from the, or from the origin to give a, play, a point. And, well, it's useful sometimes to be able to convert one to the other, which we can do. This is just review. I'm just stalling you out. A few people are still finishing. We use uh, the fact the definition of the cosine and the sine to relate r, x, y, theta, whatever. So r is the cosine of theta. What am I doing? X is r cosine theta. From the picture, y is r sine theta, r squared is x squared plus y squared, and theta is the r tangent of x. So maybe it's a bar tangent of theta. So we can switch back and forth from polar to rectangular. Usually when you're using polar coordinates, you don't even want to think in polar or rectangular, just like if you're speaking Spanish, it's better if you just think in Spanish rather than trying to think in English and translate. So the power of polar coordinates is you can do a better way to describe curves that are hard, if not impossible, to describe in terms of rectangular coordinates. So sort of natural, better to just naturally think polar. Can I stop this quicker question? Anybody still working on it? Okay, so we'll now pause, see how people are doing. If anybody has a clue. Okay, so almost everybody got this right. Well, more than half of you got this right. You can't see this chart unless you have really good eyes because they didn't lower the screen yet. I guess I can try and lower the screen part of Where it looks like when I do So you can see that most of you know that the right answer is 1 plus the sine. The way to figure this out, since I'm giving you a choice, is to just test some points. So not to try and convert one to the other, although you can do that, but just think about what's going on here. When the angle is zero degrees, well, we go through some positive number. And so that already, well, no, all of these go through zero one. Well, except this one, this one goes to zero two in rectangle. So all of these are sort of a good candidate. But now think about what happens to the sign as the or the cosine. What happens to the cosine as the angle increases is that the cosine decreases. And so if we went and the cosine of pi over 2, or straight up, is 0. So that would mean that if it were 1 plus the cosine, this should come in. It should be closer here, it should be closer here than it is here. But this one's further here than it is here. So that rules this one out. Uh, 1 minus the sine as the angle increases. This should go down to 0 because, because the sine of pi over 2 is 1. So I would have 1 minus, zero, 1 minus 1, which is 0. So that means that when I look this way, I should be hitting the origin. So if it were 1 minus the sine, I would want to do something like that. So that rules this guy out. This guy is still. Uh, in the running, um, because this goes from 1 to 2, 
and it increases. If you look here, this angle, this distance gets longer and longer as I go up. And then as I continue, uh, the sine is going to decrease down to negative 1. So it will be decreased back down, right, because the graph of the sine looks like this. So the radius will decrease back down to 0 when I'm looking this way. So I should be symmetric here. I should decrease back down to the same distance here, but looking the other way. Again, this one is matching. This one is not doing the right thing. And then as I continue even more, it should decrease, because now I'm in the negative signs, I should get radii less than 1 down here. So all of these radii are less than 1. So this one is really the only one that's viable out of these choices. So that's sort of a way that you can look at it, compare it to a known equation, and say, yeah, that's reasonable. Um, so, let's see. I don't where the, oh, cool. So, you may be far. I don't know. What I want to do for the next couple of minutes is actually uh, show you. So, plotting polar graphs, just like plotting any kind of graph, is a little bit, let me get rid of this. Sorry is a little bit, I don't know, tedious to do by hand. And computers are very good at this sort of thing. So, for example, if I just did the one that's on the board there. Oh, they called it T, I don't think yet. Oh, geez, come on. OK, let me make my size bigger so I can. So if I want to plot 1 plus the sine of T, there it is. It looks kind of like what I drew. And again, you know, you just think about what's going on with the relationship of R. Now, essentially what I want to do for the next, I don't know, five minutes or so, is just play with this, give you some sense of what other sorts of things we can see when we, when we mess with polar graphs. And then I want to turn to actually doing some calculus with polar graphs. Um, so maybe, you know, instead of changing this t, uh, note, well, you can't see here, but I'm tracing out more than 2 pi here, and it's just running over the same graph every 2 pi. So for example, if I just went up the first half from 0 to pi, then I just get the top half of this business, and then from pi to pi over 2, I mean to 2 pi, I pick up the bottom bit. Okay, so it's just going around and around, it's a little touching there. But the way that I've you know, put this is very sensitive to this one, because the sine is one, is negative one here, which means that it will just touch the origin at some place. So if I increase this constant here a little bit from one plus the sine, to say, I don't know, 3 halves plus the sine, what do you think is going to happen? No one has a clue? Go ahead, you're making finger movements so you can tell them. It'll get taller towards the top. What will happen on the bottom? No clue? Anybody have any kind of intuition? You could be wrong. It's okay. It'll get further out. So it won't touch here. Right? Because I'm increasing the radius. You can think of this as taking the circle, r equals 1, and then I'm adding sort of a sine curve onto it so it bows out because I'm going sine out and then bows back in because of the sine. So if I, you know, because the sine here, the radius is 1, but I'm moving inward by 1, so it's just touching. So if I change this from 1 to 3 half, as a couple of people said, it's going to get further away, and it's not going to touch, and I'll get a little lump on the bottom, rather than uh, a peak. What if I made it less than 1? So if I went, instead of 3 halves, I went to 1 half. Now what's going to happen? The top will come in closer. What will happen at the bottom? 
It'll come up high. So, do you think I will see something? So, you know, I can just do it, but that's no fun. Um, do you think, so it'll, it'll come in lower, and then here it's going to come up higher. Is it going to come up higher like this, you think? What's going to happen? It'll make a loop, exactly. So if I make it a half, then I get a loop, like that. It comes in, it makes a little loop, you and then goes away again. Again, if you think of this as being, taking a circle, and then moving the radius in and out as I go, then this makes some amount of sense. You've got to work on it a little bit to see that it will make a loop. Um, what if I increase the angle so that the angle goes faster than the angle? Does that make any sense? No. Let's try this again. So instead of that graph, let's try a different one. So instead of doing that, so let's just, we talked about this one last time. R equals sine of theta just gives us a circle like that. What if instead of being the sine of theta, I make it the sine of 2 theta? So let's think about, so remember, let's remember here, when r is sine theta, this actually sweeps out this circle. Let me first do the first quarter. So when theta goes from 0 to pi over 2, I get the, the one side of the circle. And then when I go from pi over 2 to pi, I get the next side of the circle. And then as I go from pi to pi over, to, to 3 pi over 2, then I get the same side of the circle, but looking backwards. Oh, come on. So when I go from pi to 3 pi over 2, this is a little harder to see. The angle is down here, and we're going backwards because the sine is negative in this in the lower two quadrants. So the radius is negative, so I'm going backwards. I'm looking this way, but my distance is back there. Okay? So again, we're a little if I if I just so let's just go the whole two pi business. Zero two times pi. So this is traversing the circle twice. Once in the, in the first and second quadrant, and then the second time with the negative r when theta is in the third and fourth quadrant. So for every pi, it goes around the circle once. What if I just multiply a constant here? What's going to happen? It'll get bigger. So all I get is a bigger circle. Nothing interesting there. You probably can't even see that it goes through 3 now instead of 1. What if I put my constant inside the angle instead? So instead of looking at sine of pi, or sine of theta, I'm going to look at twice the angle. Now something very different will happen. In the first quadrant, let's just look in the first quadrant to get an idea of what's going on. So I'm just going to go from 0 to pi over 2. Well, when theta goes from 0 to pi over 2, what happens to the sine of theta? It goes from 0 to 0, passing through 1. I'm sorry. When theta goes from 0 to pi over 2, the sine of 2 theta goes from, from, from 0 up to 1 and then back down again. So that means that instead of being at its maximum angle here, it's going to be at the maximum here. So instead of going out and in in the first quarter term, I'm going to go out and in in the first quarter of a term. I said quarter twice. Instead of in the first half turn, I go all the way out and all the way in. I do it in a quarter of a term. So I'll have something that would look kind of like a circle, but I squash it all over here. So it gives me a little loop over there. Now if I continue, now I'm looking in this quarter, this is my angle here. As my angle ranges from here to here, what does sine of twice that angle do? Will it be positive or negative? 
Did I ask this as a Cooper question? Sure, she says sure. Okay. Well, so, so my question is sine of 2 theta, when theta is here, will it be in, so theta is between pi over 2 and pi is the graph in A, first quadrant, B, second quadrant, C, third quadrant, D, fourth quadrant, E, Roth, So I would like you to answer this quickly because we do have to get somewhere. It's either it's channel 26 or 41. Okay, so I'm going to give you 15 seconds more. If you don't know, just make a random guess. Or don't. Whatever. Okay, so what did we get? I'm going to stop this now. Stop. Are you? No, I'm too late. Stop. So, it seems that nobody thinks it's in Roth quad. Uh, it's either in the second quadrant or the fourth quadrant. So let's think about which it would be. So theta is between pi over 2 and pi. And so the sign, so that means 2 theta is between pi and 2 pi. So when 2 theta is between pi and 2 pi, the sign is positive or negative? Negative. So that means that when I look over here, my radius is negative, so I'm down here. So it will be in the fourth quadrant. And let's just check that. I'll make, let my computer make the picture. And then soon I've got to move on. Okay. So here, if we go from pi over 2, let me get rid of some of these junk that's plugged in the screen. Pi over 2. <laughs> to pi. But well, you can't quite see that that's the fourth quadrant, so let's include the first part as well. Now maybe you can see that's the fourth quadrant. It's down below. Because our angle is looking this way, but our radius is negative, so we have to back up. It's behind us. And then as I continue, when I go from pi to 3 pi over 2, when I'm here in this quadrant, again, I'm looking negative, so it will be behind. And so if we do the whole business, well, let's just look at the next section. So I go from pi to pi times 3 over 2. I'm sorry, it's positive again. Sorry, so the rays is positive. I was thinking straight because it's the sign, not the cosine. It's positive again, and then in the next quadrant, it's negative again. So what's happening here in the curve, in the first quadrant, it's here. Then when I'm looking over here, R is negative, so I get this. And then when I'm looking over here, R is positive again, I'll get this. And then when I'm looking over here, R is negative again, I get this. And so I'll get a little clover leaf. 
So let me just do the whole thing out to 2 pi. Come on. And I get a little four leaf, it's usually called a four leaf rose, but it's more like a clover to me. Green on the inside. Um, okay. And just to, you know, Go a little further than that, if we go from 2 pi to 4 pi, it'll double the number of leaves. And if we go you know, to 8 pi, then I'll keep up here, we'll go to 42 pi, and then I'll get a whole bunch of leaves there. So, something like that, so let's go back to something you can see, like 4 pi. We get twice as many leaves as the doubling of the angle. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm writing saying pi, writing t, and meaning theta. Yeah, this is why I'm confused. I could write theta here, but, you know, part of it is t is type t-h-e-t-a all the time. Um, so here, and the same business happens with the cosine. If you think about it for a minute, it's just going to turn it a little. Okay. But something a little bit funny happens if this angle is odd. Instead, of, so let's look at 2 pi just so we can see. So for 2 pi, we get a little propeller. We get four leaves on the road. But if I go to 3 pi, 3 theta, I keep saying pi, thank you. If I go to 3 theta, instead of getting six leaves, I only get three. So for odd numbers, I get the same. If you think about this, this is because 0 to 4 pi divides nicely by 2, but by 3 it doesn't. So here I go over the same thing twice. If you just think about how the angle varies, so for odd, vari odd multiples, I get the same number of leaves, and for even I get twice as many. Don't memorize this, it's stupid to memorize this. You just realize that there can be some surprises here. And if I add a little constant to it, say 1 plus, then this will pull it out a little bit. It'll come in and touch several times. Uh, maybe just to emphasize that it's coming in and touching, let's make it 1.2 plus. So it comes in and then goes back out again. So here I'm taking the circle, and I'm moving in and out as I go around the circle. If we go to an even number, back to 4 pi, you can see what's going on with that loop de loop that we got before. Sometimes it's coming in, making the back, sometimes not. If the radius wiggling is less than 1, like 0.4, then you can see how the double loops are changing. This is where it's positive, and then this is where it's negative. And then it's positive, and then it's negative. And then it's positive, and then it's negative. The big loops are where it's positive in this case, and the little loops are where it's negative. And of course, you get really crazy things if we don't put an integer here like, I don't know, 4 sevenths. Oops. If I put 4 sevenths here, I need a little more than 2 pi. Let's do, let's go a lot. So we get really nice pictures. Um, that make like little mandalas and things. Uh, this is fairly complicated because what's happening, well, let's do one seventh instead. So you can see that we get little variations that are going in and out and in and out and all around. So we can make all sorts of crazy stuff happen. I would encourage you to, to play with this with something that can graph polar graphs. I really have to move along because the point is I wanted to be able to talk about the area, calculating the area here, doing calculus with these curves. Because this is a calculus class, this is not a pre-calculus class, so this is not a study of functions. So these are good to play with, but the real point is I want to introduce now some calculus. So I'm done with this, I'm going to turn it off. Off, no. Okay. Uh, like that. Just up. Okay, so one of the things. Is it still on? 
One of the things that calculus is useful for is taking derivatives. <coughs> so if I have some function like, let me just draw it this way, r equals f of theta, I can certainly take the derivative of r And this tells me something. What does it tell me? So what does uh, f prime of theta equals 0 mean? What is this telling me is happening with the graphs if the derivative is 0? Derivative of r with respect to theta. It reaches either a max or a min, or maybe a, a flat spot. So it means that f of theta is a critical point, which is it's a max, a min, or maybe an inflection point. So in terms of a polar graph, this is telling us, so again, remember, we're talking about the radius. It's either at a max or a min. Or maybe some kind of inflection point where it's going out, flattens out, and then continues. It's perpendicular to the radius. So this tells you the same kind of thing. Also, if the derivative is infinite, it means it's parallel to the radius. Right? If f prime of theta, me track here. So if it's infinite, then this means that the graph is moving parallel to the radius. So here, here's my, my angle that I'm looking at, and the graph is going to be like this. It kind of peaks like that something coming tangent to the radius. Usually it's going to be some kind of peak, but it could also do something like this. Something like that. So, I don't really want to focus a whole lot on that, because really the focus of this class is not on differential calculus, although this is a context in which you're thinking about derivatives slightly differently. Um, so, this is to just give you some sense of how the derivative is useful in other contexts. You just have to change how you're thinking about it a little bit. In fact, polar coordinates are an example of something more general called parametric equations. Usually the focus of parametric equations, in, in, at Stony Brook anyway, is done... Why does it seem like all the lights are? Because they aren't. Okay. Uh, usually the focus on parametric equations at Stony Brook is done in Calculus 3, in Math 203, or Math 307, or AMS 263. I don't remember the number. Does anyone know? 
calculus three for five math? No. Whatever it is. I used to know it. I knew it, except for today. Anyway, the focus in parametric equations, so parametric equations is, is how it's useful to describe curves in space, and really this is part of the focus of calculus three. So I don't want to do a lot of this. Okay, but now let's turn to the idea of area. Because this is really somewhat relevant to what we've been doing. So again, thinking that I have some curve, it doesn't really matter what the curve looks like too much. And I want to understand well, no, I don't want that. So I want to understand how I might find the area inside such a curve. Of course, one way is to convert it to rectangular do the integral in rectangular, and then say, uh-huh, there's the area. That way pretty much sucks, because a lot of times you can't do the conversion, or you get something horrible. Um, but here we can just sort of think polar, and think about, obviously it should have something to do with the integral. But we don't want to just integrate f of r. I mean r equals f of theta, because that will not give us actually what we want. So let's think about, let's say, you know, maybe this looks like a circle. Let's do something a little more complicated. Say I have a loop like that. So I'll just do the exact this example that I just did. R equals, well, I'll just do it as f of theta, but you can think of f of theta as being the sine of 2 theta. And how would I get the area of this loop? So I would do the same kind of thing that we do to get the area on a curve like this. We chop it up into little bits. But instead of my bits being dx, my bits will be d theta. So I want to cover this in little sectors. which sweep out the graph, where the angle here is some little fraction of theta, d theta. And I want to think about what is the area of this. So I want the area of such a little slice like this. So the area here would be the integral from theta equals, let's just call it a, to theta equals b. And let me not write down what it is. Let's just say the area of the little wedge. d theta. Does this make sense? Are you following this? So if we figure out how to calculate what the area of the little wedge is for a tiny angle d theta, then we can figure out the area of the whole thing by adding up the areas of the infinitesimal wedges that is integrating d theta for little wedges. In the same sense that we found volumes, by adding up the volumes of infinitesimal little disks or cylinders or whatever. And the same way that we found work by adding up the amount of work over an infinitesimal time unit or distance unit. So it's the same idea that we've been doing already. We figure out what the area of a slice is, and then we integrate that area to get the whole thing. Okay. Well, I guess the d theta is in here, right? The d theta is going to be here. Otherwise, that would give me a ball. It's 
just the area of these where this is equal. So let's figure out what the area of such a slice would look like. Well, just like when we were doing all of the other things, we just assume that the function is pretty much constant over that little slice. Right, so here's my polar curve. This, I'm just drawing a big version. Here's a big d theta. And I'm going to assume that the function is pretty much constant.
uh, say r equals sine 2 theta. Well, now I need to think about, so one thing I need to think about is, so remember that the graph of sine 2 theta, well, my picture is bad already. Looks like that. I want the area inside this clover. And so this means it's just going to be, well, I start here and I sweep out the whole clover in sort of a funny order. But if I go theta from 0 to pi, then I pick up the whole thing. So I want here, the whole thing is picked up from theta to pi. What am I doing wrong? Pi over 2. No, 2 pi. No, pi. My brain is... What's wrong here? I want 2 pi. Okay. So, or, or I can just think of one leaf. This is 4 times the area of this. And I get this as theta goes from 0 to pi over 2. 0 to pi over 2. So anyway, it's the integral, 1 half, of the integral of, the, of sine 2 theta squared d theta. That's the area of this, but I want the whole thing, so I want 4 of those. From, didn't I write? Oh, I didn't write. Sorry, from 0 to pi over 2. Which is also the same as the area from 0 to 2 pi without multiplying by 4. Doesn't matter, it's the same. Okay? So that gives me the area. Let me not do that integral. So let me remind you how to do that integral. So this is a sine squared. So this means that you use the uh, half angle formula, you turn it into a cosine of 4 theta. Right? People remember how to do that? You need me to do that. Or you ask your computer. No, do it. Okay, well then we have a whole two minutes to do it. Don't do it? No, do it. Okay, so I'm hearing, don't do it, no, do it, don't do it, no, do it. So let me just give you the hint. We use the fact, do it, do it, jump, jump, kill yourself, do it! <laughs> So, um, we use the fact that sine squared of theta is 1 half 1 minus the cosine of 2 theta, right? So in this case, instead of having a theta here, we have a 2 theta here. So I have sine squared of 2 theta is 1 half 1 minus the cosine of 4 theta. And so this integral <coughs> so this integral so 2 0 to pi over 2 uh, sine squared theta b theta oops, 2 theta becomes one half, and that gives me, well, let's just do a two. So one half, one minus the cosine of four theta, d theta. And so this part, this part, two times the half, this is gone, forget it. So the integral of one is theta uh, minus 0 pi over 2 integral of cosine 4 theta, let me just say it. The integral of minus cosine 4 theta is sine 4 theta, but I need to divide by 4 because of the integral. Evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. So at 0, this is 0, or at pi over 2, this is a quarter of the sine 
of 4 times pi over 2, that's 2 pi, so that's 0. So that just gives me a pi over 2. And it's 0, this is 0. So we're done. So assuming I didn't screw it up, that's what the answer is. Um, so let me just point out, if you really insist on Monday, I will do another problem like this. But on Monday, we're supposed to start a new aspect of this course, which is on infinite series. So on Monday, no! And all of you refugees from 127 that just showed up, jump, jump, slip your wrist, let me see. Um, you're really feeling suicidal at this point. But, yeah. Okay, so I will see you Monday.